Mm. How are we feeling then, guys? Full of energy? I have been sanding down furniture all morning. and yep. Sanding I... down the edges, just like Sue Gray. <laughs> so I am a little tired of both the suit, waiting for the Sue Gray report and in general, and in general. Cool. Shall we give it a go? We shall. And welcome to Beerith, our short form analysis pods for each of our Heerith episodes on our main podcast feed. This week we'll be taking a look at broadcasting, specifically public service broadcasting in the UK and the potential impact of changes proposed via a tweet by the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, Nadine Dorries. For our Heerith episode, we spoke to the former chair of the Senate's Culture Committee, Bethan Syed, and Tim Hartley, who was the former head of corporate affairs at S4C. And... Uh, in the Beer Eye room, we have Richard Mine. Hello, Rich. Hey, Matt. And Kerry Davis. Hello, Kerry. Afternoon, gentlemen. Kerry, what was your assessment of the pod? What did you make of it? It's one of the pods, which isn't really an area I know much about. It's an area I haven't worked in. So I found it really interesting. It's uh, linked in with so many of the things which we, we hear about and a little bit about where we think Hiraith is trying to take us to, you know, the whole media and put in Civic Wales further on the map, and will what's being proposed erode that? And I thought both guests were excellent in their responses. I, I know Tim from old, but I know Tim from the football pitch. So it was really nice to, to listen to Tim in a professional capacity, and I thought he was really good. And uh, some of what he said actually really, really struck home, as did his article in uh, The National. I really enjoyed the pod, but... The research I've done afterwards has left me actually a little bit nonplussed in that it is one of those things which we talk about every so often and we won't hear about it again for another few years until the next big issue comes up. What about yourself, Matt? We talk about the broadcasting of devolution and the, the threat to SOC, Radio Cymru, the, you know, the, the volume of public service broadcasting for Wales that sites like the BBC can do. We know what the problems are, but we just don't have the capacity or the will to solve them. But yeah, I think the episode was very interesting. And it's in it was good to get it, I think, from so from the perspective of someone who's both worked in S4C like Tim and someone who has a huge interest in this area, like Bethan, who has been the chair of a committee on the issue and really dug deep into some of the more substantive questions in in relation to, well, specifically S4C and broadcasting more generally. But again, this is a perfect example of they knew what was right. They know what's wrong and they vaguely know how to solve it. But it's getting the political will to, to move the dial on it that's, that really is the, sh the issue. And I think even through the answers we saw from, from Tim and, and Bethan, there's just, there's just still a long way to go. Rich, do you agree? Yeah, I think um, so many different things are so sort of shallow in terms of the debate, uh, the stuff that prompted it from uh, Dean Doris as part of the operation Save Big Dogs Red Meat, and um, also the FM's response, which was, again, just utterly wafer thin. It's really interesting. This debate has been raging uh, about the devolution of broadcasting, and I say that in inverted commas because anyone who's had the pleasure, and it is a pleasure, to have a tweet exchange with Andy Regan, formerly of uh, the Institute of Welsh Affairs, about what that actually means, um, you, re you very quickly realise that it's, it's so ill-defined, and understanding what possible influence Wales could have on the broadcasting and wider media regulation sector is so complex and there is very, very little work done on it. Although it was really interesting to hear both of them talking about, you know, things that we should be utterly, you know, really open minded to as a country, you know, there was a proper like barbecue full of sacred cows, you know, there was the public and various other things potentially up for reconsideration about the value. I'm, you know, I, I'm not sure how popular those things, the decisions would be, but, you, you know, you've got to applaud two experts in their field being open to the idea of it. But I think, you know, the takeaway, you know, particularly salient to us was um, we had uh, one comment from Bethan saying, you know, how it's essential that kind of people try and fill the media void in Wales. Uh, and that's one of the things that we do with Hiraith. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> Tim quite rightly said that, uh, that there's not a great deal of money to be made in that. So you, it's very difficult to make a sustainable career in some, in some of the new forms of, uh, of work. So digital news, 
um, podcasting, etc., in lieu of traditional broadcast and journalism work. So, um, you know, I'm not speaking to you through a platinum or gold-plated microphone. This is uh, this is the cheapest Amazon could provide. But really interesting pod. But I, again, I, I really echo what I think Kerry said. You know, there's just not enough work done on this. Um, there's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of sentiment around it. But there's just not enough policy work behind the scenes. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, we should get Tim Hart, like, a big quote plaque for Here I HQ when it eventually, when the millions start rolling in with uh, <laughs> podcasts make no money. Well, since we recorded the episode, Rich, we've had um, David T.C. Davis, obviously the Wales office minister, on Pau by Varn on SLC having a go at bits of the Welsh media. He was particularly aggressive against Nation, which he called a propaganda wing of Plaid Cymru. Oh, he actually called it a propaganda wing of Plaid Cymru and Welsh Labour, but I don't think uh, Leonid Morgan was uh, was was agreeing there. Um, uh, but he, he also did defend the commitment of the UK government to SLC. What was your analysis of his appearance on Pablo Van? Well, I think I can share the analysis of somebody called Richard, but it's a Richard with a, a far bigger brain than I, uh, and a far, you know, frankly, greater understanding of the politics of it. And it's exactly what was referred to by Beth and... Um, in the pod and preempted the publication of the pod uh, in a great thread by Professor um, Richard Wynne Jones um, about S4C, you know, a nominal bit of funding thrown at S4C, which, you know, seven and a half, seven, was it 7.9 million, seven and a half million feels, you know, it feels like a big number, but in the context of, uh, you know, a, a media organization producing content to fill schedules all day long, all year long, that's a drop in the ocean. And um, he quite rightly predicted that the UK government would use S4C as a, a human shield or a cultural shield. Um, and that's exactly what they did. The question is, of course, and this was a, a very nice follow up tweet from Beth Ann about this, the podcast on the Hero feed that we just published, is that she was saying, well, what about the next year? What about the next year? What about when the license fee comes up? There is not going to be this gift of benevolence of seven million pounds every year. That is coming to an end now. So uh, it's time limited. It has a best before date, um, and uh, and that's literally until the next next year's budget. So, um, you know, far be it from me to accuse the yeah UK government of thinking short term about anything at the moment. But it felt very much like a short term decision. How wonderful is it though that there's a program like Pau by Van when you've got a UK government minister and a Welsh government minister, uh, among others, having a long form discussion about a broad range of politics. You know, things like and Abid and Olair as well, things like that, long form political programs, more than one of which appears on the TV at any time of a week. You know, as much as BBC Wales's coverage is fantastic on a Sunday morning and throughout the week and things like Wales cast, it's amazing stuff they do. But this is, you know, part of the broader benefit, isn't it, to Welsh civic life through, that you get through things like S4C, where you you have programs like Pablo Van Bina and there. Well, as, uh, you know, what would what would we have without S4C? You know, we'd literally have you know a, occasional opt outs on BBC and ITV and that, and Channel Four. You know, Fair Play. I think they have an outsized impact in Wales, but there would literally be nothing. Mm. Analysis of Wales would largely disappear from traditional broadcast. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's invaluable. Uh, and and um, we're all going to pick out one piece from the Hiraith pod now on broadcasting and just kind of talk about it for a little while. Uh, Matt, go first. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the importance of S4C and Radio Cymru to the Welsh language and to the coverage of Welsh life and, and politics more generally. I mean, for me, I know anyone who knows me knows my sort of rather shoddy Welsh uh, speaking skills, but without S4C, I wouldn't even have those. The, you know, the way I used to very geekily during my A-levels sit and watch episodes of Cardi and a priest dictionary on my table, checking through to see if I did, if there was a word I didn't know and uh, and learning it then, things like that. Without Without entertainment and news programming like that, I wouldn't even have the very limited Welsh skills I have now. And I think that there are thousands of people across Wales who feel exactly the same. Speaking about the news and the tweet from Nadine Dorries, there's not been a political announcement like that that has worried me quite severely for a while, really. Everybody knows that without the licence fee and the money that SOC gets from the BBC as a consequence of the licence fee, it would really struggle to survive. We talked about the sustainability of SOC 
as Tim said, the, the, you know, the epitome of market failure, the fact that you, there's not enough people in Wales who would pay for a service like S4C to continue on a subscription model. So you need the license fee. And it made me, it made me very, very concerned about the future and sustainability of S4C. And I felt incredibly worried, which is why I ran to you two and suggested that we do an episode on it. From my main takeaway is that I don't necessarily think that everybody is concerned, as concerned as they should be, about the sustainability of S4C. Yes, you've seen uh, this £7.5 million to digital digital funding, but I don't know even if that will get S4C to a position where they can compete with other providers. It probably won't. So without a long-term sustainable funding arrangement, SLC will die. Yeah, I think I think that, that from the UK government's perspective, you've got to think about this. Is this is more than devolution of the axe? This is devolution of the axe, and the person who is going to pick up that axe also has a target on the back because what they've done is they've said in the future the BBC is going to be responsible for all funding of S4C, so they wash their hands of that. But it also, when inevitably the BBC has to cut its budget in the future, it will cut the budget for S4C. So the UK government can also bash the BBC for cutting the budget of S4C. So it's a double win for the UK government. That is such canny positioning because they, they will come out of it with their hands clean. In the future, they can they can position themselves as still as defenders of S4C because they will be accusing the BBC of underfunding it, despite the fact that they've created the conditions for that. It feels very toxic uh, for the future funding of S4C. Anyway. Um, Absolutely. Uh, uh, just on that, Rich, it's, it's very similar to what they did with the licence fees for pensioners. It's exactly what they did. They devolved the axe. Uh, one other thing before I just move on with my thoughts from the pod review is that uh, is an appreciation for the way we consume media now and the, the, just the volume and variety of media that is, a, is in front of us and available for us. Uh, it's something I try to get out in my questioning and probably fail to for just the way I articulated the question. But I think that one of the SOC's major potential pitfalls is that it cannot provide the volume and variety of programming that people feel like they, they are entitled to because of the range of programming that is available on on the on the wide myriad of subscription services. If you want a cooking show, you can get a cooking show. You want a travel show, you get a cook, travel show. You want a history program, you get a history program, political coverage, news, sport, anything. You can get it on every other platform in a variety of political persuasions, if that's your thing, or a variety of cuisines, again, if that's your call. Because SLC is one channel and so limited in what it can offer, people are, are just going to start going somewhere else with the kind of media they want. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to shut up now and hand over. But Kerry, have you got anything to add on those points? I, I think one thing we didn't touch on in the pod, um, which has just struck me by how we at home engage with media, and I've got two well-speaking daughters, and um, I don't think they watch S4C outside um, school at all, and they don't really watch television at all. You know, as you just said, the way we consume media is very, very different. They take it online through YouTube and things like that. So the future of S4C isn't just about its funding. It's, as you just said, Matt, it's about, you know, what it can produce, how it produces, and how that is um, absorbed by not so much a a market. It is a market, but how it's absorbed by the audience it has, I suppose. There's there's a range of issues for S4C in the future. My my part of the pod, which I was just going to focus on, was really, I thought, Tim's line around how this all makes the argument for devolving broadcasting stronger and uh, Tim even admitted to changing his position on that and then challenged uh, Professor Drakeford, as he suggested, to put his money where his mouth is and made the point that government has to be very careful about what it says in this area, what, what it says, what does that mean in practice? I thought that was interesting because there is an element of this um, and again, it came out in some of the recommendations in the reports I read this morning about how what Welsh government can do more to achieve its own outcomes and also create that civic Wales which we are talking about. And um, I'm not I'm not sure what the funding is from Welsh government into into the media in Wales, but is that something which is going to have to grow if we and I think we as a pod would want you know these kind of public service aspects of the media to continue. Rich, I know that the one thing that you really were taken by 
doing that part is the, is the Tim quote of... Let's have the discussion. Let's decide what we want. What can we do? But for goodness sake, let's pay for some of it ourselves, ex- except for taking the begging bowl, you know, up to the M4 every damn time we want something. Given the huge financial and budgetary pressures on the Welsh government in other fields, do you think that media will be a priority for them? Uh, no, not in, not in the slightest. <laughs> do you think it I'd, should be? Well, yes, you're absolutely right. That's, that is the takeaway. That, that, you know, it's, it's almost the very last sentence that we spoke on the pod, and I think Tim absolutely nailed it in terms of the problem, you know, the, the dysfunction here comes from us always going down the M4 or the A5, uh, if we're from the north, down to London with uh, the begging bowl to pay, ask for money for something. And that is obviously, a, you know, deeply unhealthy. You know, if, if you if you care about something in your in your territory, whether it's a country or region or whatever, you should own the solution and you should be willing to pay to do to to make that better. Now, you know, there are all manner of dysfunctional ways that the um, the British Union works at the moment. And we understandably, the Welsh government has been unwilling to take on things, you know, both presently and historically, you know, and you can, you know, pretty much do a timeline backwards from, you know, administration of welfare, um, justice. Uh, we go back to the in now infamous decision not to take any ownership of Welsh rail infrastructure, which, you know, is still a hot topic of debate today, back in 2006, whenever it was. And there was a time when there was a discussion about whether the Senate should have oversight of S4C and the future of S4C. And, the the one thing that I kind of think about in that regard is that even now there is still no consensus on what the broadcast footprint in Wales should be like. There is still no direction of travel or agreed basic minimum. Um, and so, while you know, I think in an ideal world, and I think Tim Tim was suggesting this, that the best thing to do would be for the Senedd uh, or for the people of Wales through the Senedd to own the future of S4C at least, and Bethan would argue, um, as would many others, that that should include oversight of all broadcast broadcast and other media perhaps in Wales. But unless we have a plan about that, then what is the point? Because we'll just be letting the same thing drift. You know, if the, if the Welsh government had, you know, it's not like there's any money that would come down from the central government in Westminster um, to, to help fund it or even expand funding in it. There would be no money with it. And so without a plan, what would be the point? I'd be welcome to challenge on that. What would be the point? But um, what ne- what needs to happen? And I think that if I remember correctly, there is a committee, National Communications Council, which I think was launched a few years ago. Uh, I may be wrong under the chairpersonship of Betson Poes, maybe. But I'm kind of curious about what role that has to play in the future of broadcasting in terms of building uh, consensus for change. But someone needs to come up with a really solid plan with wide popular support. And then we can say, hey, you know what? This is what we as a nation want the future of at least S4C to look like and maybe expand that to public service broadcasting uh, more widely in multiple languages. But uh, I think, you know, at its core, without a plan, I'm, I struggle to see what the benefit would be of Welsh Government kind of being responsible ultimately or the Senate being responsible. But like I said, welcome to challenge. It's one of these. It's one of these things that keeps coming up, isn't it? When the Welsh government and the Senate are pressed with the concept of expanding their powers, they're usually fairly happy with the idea of having responsibility for a subject area. They want the powers, but they are concerned that without the power, with the power, does not necessarily come the funding. And I'm sure Kerry from his Welsh government days will be able to say that this is something that keeps rearing its ugly head time after time after time. Things like the the argument for justice in prisons and policing is always this argument. Yeah, fine, we can have the powers, but if you don't give us the funding as well, we won't be able to afford to run these services properly. And I think that's definitely something worth considering with broadcasting. But again, it's such a, it's like you say, it's such a poorly defined concept really because you'd need a regulator so you'd need a welsh version of ofcom you you couldn't have the government running it because you 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 just need in you need a media body completely independent of government i mean you've got the s4c structure i suppose so you could put that in place 
to to have an independent body that was chaired whatever and regulated and and then regulated by an Ofcom like body. But it's so it's, this is this is every every time something bad happens with Welsh media or uh, political coverage is poor or or whatever, everyone's saying, well, we should just devolve broadcasting. It's become a catch-all for everything that people don't like about the media in Wales, really. And what does it actually mean? As IWA and I used to occasionally uh, tweet about this back and forth, because Andy would say, well, what are you going to do? You're going to have uh, devolved rights over radio frequencies in Wales. Who's going who's to regulate uh, very high-frequency radio signals on the border? You know, it's just ridiculous. There are some things that, just because of geography, have to be done on an all-island basis. So there would have to be all-island uh, broadcasting infrastructure agreement. The problem at the moment is that even though we have Ofcom, we have a Ofcom Cymru, there is no power there. There's no weight to it. And you know, without wanting to advocate the idea of federalism, because we've covered that really rather well, but a lot of broadcasting will always have to be done on an all-island basis um, from a, a uh, from a not governance, what's the word, um, regulation point of view. So, but what we need to do is have the kind of parity and and sort of sense of ownership across and across all of the governments of this island. And that's that's where, you know, you get wrapped into the great big historical problems with the union's sort of asymmetry and how everything is focused in one little corner in the hands of a very small and perhaps very unrepresentative group of people. Um, it's, a, it's a really tough nut to crack. I know Bethan's, Bethan's committee did a number of reports that, as she articulated, focused on some aspects of regulation of broadcasting. That, that maybe that's as far as we've got so far, but we need a far more comprehensive plan. And frankly, what is the point of doing broadcasting in isolation when you don't, you know, when you also have online and print and all of these things. So, you know, because, because the boundaries are increasingly blurred. Um, so, yeah, really, really tricky one. And I, I think that, you know, considerable more work to do, not just from government, not just from the Senate, but actually from whole of civic society about it. It's, it's back to what I, I said at the start. We've got, there is work being undertaken and it is good work. I think one of the, one of the hidden things in devolution for me is the, the work the committees do and the quality of what they produce. And without, annoying chairs or committee clerks so often they're they're shelf warmers and so for example one of the reports which i looked at was one beth and shared last year and it is it's about exploring the devolution of broadcasting how can wales get the media it wants and it's something i should have read before we had the pod but it's one i didn't look at too much today because there isn't a welsh government response on the website and so that's last March I think so we're a year into that and it's exactly what we're talking about it's so pertinent to this whole discussion including you know the figures so you know it'd be useful for us to have had in the pod and today that 184 million is the estimated license fee raise in Wales with a BBC estimate of a spend of 179 million including what they do for S4C so puts a picture which is isn't as bad as what many people might think on the funding aspect of the BBC in Wales. And, you know, we're we're obviously focusing on Wales, but one of the things which came up in the pod, which really interested me, is, you know, what would be hit in England. And those regional stations Tim mentioned, which uh, provide a local link across England, are incredibly important, I think. I think it would be incredibly damaging to the UK if those were to go on a number of areas. So... I am rambling, but I just think that the work which is out there already on devolution of media, it, it needs a wider audience. It, it isn't just published on one day in March and that's it. It doesn't get looked at again. I'd like to see committees come back to their reports every three years and get an update. Otherwise, what are we doing with them? It, so, you know, I'd urge anyone interested in this area. There's at least three fantastic pieces of work from... I can't remember what the current committee's name is, but the Culture and Media Committee on this subject. So look at what those um, recommendations are and who's contributed and what the responses have been. There's information out there. I just think we've got to, as I've said before on the pod in Wales, I think we need to do less, but do it better. And I think the media we, could be an area which we do that in. I mean, one of the one of the you talk about coming back to committee reports every three years. Isn't one of the major issues in Wales is that all we do is take everything to a committee or an inquiry? 
do you think that there's a a call for a broader, more grassroots political campaign on this? I mean, you know, you've seen stuff like um, Kamdait Asiriyaif doing lots of work on devolving broadcasting or Datkanali Datledi. So, but beyond that, it doesn't feel as though beyond Welsh language groups, there's a huge call for this. Not that they, I don't necessarily think that there isn't a huge call for this. I'm just saying you don't see a, a, a formalised campaign around things like that from groups outside of Welsh language groups? Oh, 100% agree. As with so many campaigns in Wales, they tend to be uh, they tend to be driven by activists in Welsh language communities. That's not to say that people who are English speaking well, English speaking Wales isn't supportive, but it's just less salient. Whereas I think there has always been uh, a greater appetite for for being an activist when you're part of a minority community than perhaps there is when you're part of the majority community. So if you want it to be truly popular, it has to really come from that corner. And uh, unfortunately, particularly with regards to broadcasting, a lot of it focuses on S4C. I'm not sure if that's entirely right, but the people who get most exercised about the threats to S4C are inevitably our speakers for the most part, not, not the whole part, but the most part. So it, it requires a massive shift in emphasis in order to be a truly widespread campaign uh, but it also needs people to come you know to to lead that campaign um, and we're you know that's again where we have an issue in wales just to point out that on the the wales does a everything by committee i know that's hmm. an old uh uh stereotype with some justification my point was more that we just don't recreate the same committee every five years and look at the same things I think, you know, that corporate memory of what we look at, what we study and what we recommend needs to be rolled forward, not reinvented every few years. And I think there's examples of that reinvention galore, including many I've worked on myself. So it is a frustration. No, and I, and I, I don't mean to, to take away from the fantastic work that inquiries and committees do in Wales. It's just that you do feel a little bit like we 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 bang the same door every couple of years and expect expect huge changes and it, it just it, it just gets very frustrating especially on things like this where you can really see a finish line for s we'll see if something doesn't happen yeah but that, things are changing though i mean you've got to you've got to imagine you know just a few years ago what a shock it would have been for a labor first minister of wales to call for the devolution of broadcasting for wales you know, we've only had devolution for 23 years, as it is now. And for the major vast majority of those 23 years, those are not words that would have passed the First Minister's lips. So think the context is changing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of argument has improved to the standard and um, that it needs to to actually make it happen. It hasn't. Just as well, gents, as I'm crossing the border with my last point, it is worth noting that it, it, is, it isn't just a Wales issue. I think I mentioned what Tim said in the pod, but um, just looking at some of the things that have been presented to Parliament, the, the Westminster Committee, Digital Culture, Media, Sports Committee, back in 2019, there was talk then, the Director General, Lord Hall, said that the way the licence fee discussions happen is wrong and it needs to change in 2021. I, I don't think what he envisaged about parliamentary involvement has actually come to come to the fore but we are talking about a subject which is uk-wide problematic and has got big ramifications across the uk not just wales and uh, i think there's an awful lot of people in england very very unhappy with uh, what's been said in the last few weeks as well with the threat of potentially making the, the name of this podcast completely irrelevant, I would also draw everybody's attention to a really great episode of the BBC's BBC Radio 4's Briefing Room with David Aronovich, which discusses BBC funding, because there is a tendency it, to just kind of build on what you just said, Kerry. It's a tendency to think about this as a Wales-specific issue, and there's a tendency, tendency to think about the licence fee as a peculiarly British institution. It is not. 
it's commonplace. It's exactly how European public service broadcasters, the majority of them are funded, and all of European countries are looking at the exact same question. It's something that is an international issue, and there are international comparators out there. And just as some of our best MSs, and I would draw attention to the work that Mabon at Gwynvor is doing with regards to housing, by not by looking outside of Wales, looking at continental Europe and elsewhere to see how they address the issues of rural housing um, in other parts of Europe, I think we should be doing exactly the same with regards to funding of public service broadcasting. Uh, it just requires a real, it requires leadership and a, someone to go out and champion it. Right. Before the pun in our new, uh, new, new name becomes incredibly ironic, um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for listening to this first installment of Birife from us, the team who produce the Hirife podcast, which of course you can still find in your favourite podcast app. Thank you again to Richard Martin and Kerry Davis. If you want to find Rich on Twitter, you can go to... At Mimosa Kamri. Mr. Davis, you can find him at... Uh, still Kerry the Viking. And you can find me at Hexter101, H-E-X-T-E-R-101. And you can find Hirife on Twitter and Facebook at Pod for all our latest news, pods and videos. Dior and Hoyle.